Okay, so good morning, good day, good evening. Okay, so it doesn't matter what time you have opened this lecture video, but I'd like to say that uh, I hope everyone is in uh, the best of condition for uh, listening to a lecture video. Okay, so for today, we have the prelim lecture three, uh, bacterial growth and classification. And later I'll be um, making another lecture video for uh, bacterial genetics. So for this particular lecture, uh, this will be divided into two parts. Now we have the classification of bacteria and the learning outcomes for this particular part of the topic could be the following. So at the end, the students are expected to be able to categorize the basic principles of microbial classification system and to be able to discuss the structural and biological characteristics that we use in classifying bacteria. So there are three known classification systems that are widely used in microbiology, and that would include bacteriology, of course. So we have numerical taxonomy, uh, phylogenetic classification, and of course, phenotypic classification, which is uh, the most common. Now for numerical taxonomy, this makes use of computer. Uh, the computer would cluster different strains of organisms at uh, selected levels of overall similarity, you know, um, usually on the basis of the frequency with which they share uh, traits. Okay, So you can see this in Burgess Manual, usually, uh, I think, page 39. So if you can get a copy of that, you could check that out. Okay, So like... Uh, when we use machines, right, like Vitek, for example, so it uses computer taxonomy or numerical taxonomy. So we provide bacterial organisms with a certain set of numbers to identify them and to separate them from uh, the other members of the same genus. Okay. Then we have uh, phylogenetic classification. So uh, the basis for this type of classification system is the uh, genetic similarity. You know? So groups reflect genetic similarity as well as uh, evolutionary relatedness. Okay. So say, for example, uh, feline family, you know, the cat family, for example. So they are grouped together because of the presence of the whiskers, the presence of pointed ears, okay, uh, the eyes that would reflect light, and so on. So uh, phylogenetic classification. Of course, the genes, you know, uh, similarity of the proteins okay, that are shown on uh, genetic studies. Okay? And then, of course, phenotypic classification. So this would be based on the overall similarity. So this is what we usually do in the laboratory when we uh, culture and then we review you know, uh, those cultured organisms microscopically and check out their morphology. Okay, And so this is an example of a machine that we use or a computer that we use to identify organisms uh, numerically. Okay, so we have the Vitec 2. Okay, so it's an automated instrument for identification as well as sensitivity testing. So AST here is antibiotic or antimicrobial sensitivity testing. Okay, so this one, uh, the colored thing here, and this is actually API. We use this for identification of uh, Enterobacteriaceae. Okay, so this colored things that you see here are actually gel, no gelatin, which includes uh, particular carbohydrates and materials that are needed in order for us to identify uh, the organism. And so we have uh, numbers here to indicate uh, the intensity or the presence of the reaction that we would like to see, you no, know, to identify a particular uh, bacteria. Okay, and then so. Number four, this is what we see you know, as uh, the, uh, uh, on the interface of the computer, the Vitec, uh, after the assay is done. Okay? So we have here ID values or numbers that are used to identify sp specific uh, species of a uh, group of organism. Okay? 
of course, for phylogenetic uh, classification. So we base solely on uh, this uh, phylogenetic tree. Note that we have three domains of living organism. Okay, so domains are the large groups into which we uh, classify or categorize organisms. So we have uh, the domain bacteria, which includes, of course, everything that we will be discussing in this course. And then we have domain archaea. So the domain archaea are uh, organisms that are considered ancient. Okay, so included here are square and star-shaped bacteria that we only get to see from the Red Sea no, specimen. And then, of course, we have the domain eukaryota, which would include us humans no, under the kingdom animalia. And then we have uh, fungal organisms are also eukaryotes. They belong to the domain eukaryota. Same with the parasites. No? So you have here the ciliates, the flagellates, the trichomonads. Okay? So you have met those in your parasitology course last summer. Okay, So, uh, of course, part and parcel of classifying organisms are to provide them with names. Now, before they are provided with names, they are given the complete you know, classification and they are usually, there are usually seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven taxa or levels when we classify organisms. So their names are not just limited to two, no, the genus and the species. Actually, they have a very, very, very long name. Okay, so uh, the levels of classification called taxon or taxa, if there are a lot, no, so in this case, taxa. Okay, so taxon is a group or a level of classification. So these are the hierarchical systems within the domains. So recall earlier, there are three domains, right? So you have the domain bacteria, the domain archaea, and the domain eukarya. So each of those domains are further divided into seven levels of classification or taxa. So we have kingdom. After domain, we have kingdom, then phylum or division then class, then order, family, genus, and species. So before we were asked to memorize a mnemonic, no? so King Philip or King David came over for good spaghetti. Okay? Yun daw para you can easily memorize the uh, order of the taxa. Okay? So kingdom, phylum or division, class, order, family, genus, and species. Of course, in the uh, references that we get to read, Okay. Uh, they usually make use only of the genus and the species because it would take so much space if you include the domain, the kingdom, the phylum, the class, the order, the family. Okay, So, of course, it would be good for us, no? for people who's going to read those books, okay? to limit ourselves to genus and species only. Okay. So species is technically the basic unit of taxonomy. No? So it's th that specific name no, that would identify one particular bacteria okay, uh, from a group of similar organisms. Okay? So kung sa pangalan pa, this would be equivalent to our given names. right? So there would be many tago, pero there would only be one tiny. Okay? So, uh, I'm sorry po. Okay? So that would be species. Okay, so it would represent a specific recognized type of organism. And uh, the ident we usually identify them by comparing you know, the uh, organisms that we were able to grow in the lab with known type strains. Okay, so how do we know that uh, the organism that we were able to grow on our culture media in our laboratory would be that particular organism? Of course, there would be uh, pure cultures, or type strains, okay? So the most widely used uh, type strains or pure cultures uh, here okay, is the ATCC. So we usually buy this so we can grow them and keep them in our laboratory. So anytime that we get confused, we get to look at these. We can grow uh, samples from this set, no? the, um, the ATCC. And so we can observe their growth and compare whatever it is that we have grown from the sample, from the patient sample. Okay, so it's our comparator, okay? So ATCC or 
the American type culture collection of organisms. So you can buy this in uh, the OST. They have this. No? So uh, come your research, for example, you'll be needing bacterial specimen, uh, bacterial uh, species. You can buy them from the OST or from uh, UPLB. Okay? But that would be much more expensive. Okay, strain. Okay, so strain is a population of microbe that has the de uh, descended from a pure culture. Okay, so if you have grown your pure culture in the laboratory and regrown them, okay, so say for example from the initial culture, you have subcultured them into another uh, plate or another uh, media. Okay, so the succeeding growth would be called strains. Okay, so different strains represent genetic variability with the species. So usually, uh, the longer we culture them, okay, or the farther they get away from their pure culture, sometimes uh, they change. You no know, morphology; they lose some of their virulence. You know? Some uh, bacteria may lose some structures in the process. Okay. So we have different strains because of that, okay? And then uh, strains can be divided into uh, different types, no? We have biovarieties or simply biovars, morphovars, and then serovars, okay? So biovars, uh, this may mean they are biologically var uh, variable from their pure culture, Okay, so one example is Europlasma urealiticum. Okay, so we have the biovars parvo and biovar T960. Okay, for morphovar, so morphologically, they are different. No, uh, in this case, for Corynebacterium diphtheriae, they are uh, morphologically different in terms of their colonies. Okay, so their colonies are uh, morphologically different. Okay. Those that are small are called mitis. Okay. Those that are intermediate or medium size, we call them intermediates. And then we have gravis. Okay. So mitis, intermediates, and gravis are the morpho varieties of Corynebacterium diphtheriae. Okay. So complete name would be, for example, uh, Corynebacterium morphovar mitis. Okay, so we insert the terms morphovar, biovar, and servar in between. Okay, and then we have for servariety, they are serologically var uh, varied from the pure culture. So we have here Salmonella enterica, servar tifi. Okay. Now, in writing the scientific name, always remember they should be in italics, no? So, italicized or underlined. So, sometimes when you're writing on your yellow paper, say, for example, for a quiz, it would be difficult to determine whether or not you have used italics, okay? So, to be sure, when we have our quizzes, our um face-to-face -face or on-site quizzes, remember to write the scientific names and underline them. Pag walang underline, mali yan. Okay? So, uh, remember to underline scientific names. Okay? And note, no? Uh, most scientific names are Latinized. Okay? So, they are Latinized. Like Escherichia coli. No? So, Escherichia is actually the name of the discover is Escheric. Okay? So, uh, we simply add no? a... Um, letters at the end to make it sound Latin. Okay. Then uh, sometimes they are descriptive, no, like uh Staphylococcus aureus. Okay, so aureus is descriptive primarily because the colonies are yellow colored. Okay. So from aurum, which is the Latin term for gold, right? So descriptive. Okay. So the names can be descriptive or it could be as uh, a, to honor the scientists to discover them. Okay, so nila Latinize lang para kunyari scientific ang dating. Okay, so species are never ever abbreviated. So what we abbreviate is the genus. Like 
Staphylococcus aureus, so S, big letter S dot aureus. But we only abbreviate if we were able to uh, introduce the complete name in the first hand. Okay, so do not introduce the abbreviated form. So first, introduce the name of the organism in full. Okay, so a genus name may be used alone to indicate a group. So you can simply say Staphylococcus. The Staphylococcus group or the Staphylococci, eh, pwede. Pero you cannot say Aureus, sino yun? Okay, wala nakakilala doon. So pwede yung Staphylococcus or Staphylococci lang. Okay, but you cannot use Aureus lang. Okay, or Coli lang. Okay. No, so, ito na, no? So, these are the examples as mentioned earlier. So, Staphylococcus aureus is actually a descriptive, no? It's a description of what the organism looks like microscopically, okay? So, Staphylo means clustered and cocci refers to their spherical structure, okay? Pabilog. Aureus is because of their golden, uh, golden yellow colonies, okay? They may not look golden microscopically because they will be stained with a different color altogether. But when we grow them on culture media, on gelatin, they're actually yellow. Okay, And then for Escherichia coli, okay, so it honors the discoverer, Theodore Escherich. Okay? So Escherichia, okay? para Latinized. Okay? And then coli refers to the colon where we usually see or isolate the organism. Okay, so again, once you have introduced the complete name, no scientific names may be abbreviated, but never start with an abbreviation. Okay, so always introduce the complete name first, and then you can abbreviate thereafter. Okay, so other examples we have here: Salmonella species. So you can use that, no Salmonella species. Okay, so say Salmonella enterica subspecies enterica. Okay, uh, one common set of variety is the Dublin. Okay, so a complete name ni Cerevoir Dublin would be uh, Salmonella enterica, subspecie enterica, Cerevoir Dublin. So it's a mouthful, di ba? Okay, pero yun yung kanya complete name. Okay, so Cerevoir is uh, capitalized, no? the Dublin. Okay, the, the, the first letter of the Cerevoir is capitalized. But it is not italicized. Okay? So if you'd like to abbreviate it, you can only abbreviate the first letter of the genus. So S dot enterica subspecies enterica cerevar Dublin. But no, uh, this shortened version is also acceptable. Okay, so Salmonella Dublin would also mean that it is Salmonella enterica, subspecies enterica, cerevar Dublin. Yun yun. Okay, so pwede rin naman siya. Kasi nga naman, di ba, ang daming words no, no? Mauubos yung space ng book kung paulit-ulit siyang imimension na ganyan. Okay, so acceptable naman si Salmonella Dublin. Okay, and then, they do have common names or trivial names, no descriptive names. Like see, si Mycobacterium tuberculosis, we know it rather, we know it also as tubercul bacillus. And the Neisseria meningitidis is also meningococcus. Okay? Uh, uh, see, si Neisseria gonorrhea is also known as the gonococcus, okay? and the group A, streptococcus, which is specifically streptococcus pyogenes, we simply know it as, uh, or refer to it as GAS or GAS, okay? so uh, shortened group A streptococcus. Okay? So the Burgess Manual of Systematic Bacteriology is actually uh, a very important tool in identification of unknowns. So for newly identified organism, this serves as a guide. Okay, so it's the main source resource for determining the identity of bacterial species, utilizing every characterizing aspect. No, so there, uh, the three types of classification is actually present in the Burgess Manual of uh, Determinative Bacteriology. Okay, so here. Okay. Uh, they use the uh, key features. Now we have the dichotomous key to narrow down identification. So, what is dichotomous key? 
ito, no? So, this is a process, really, that would help us identify the organism present in the patient specimen. So, gram reaction, is it gram negative or gram positive? If it is, if it is gram positive, no, purple colored, check the morphology. Are they rods or spherical organisms? If they are rods, they could be this organism. If they are cocci, they could be this organism. Okay. Now, what if they are gram negative? No, red ang color. Okay. Check their ability to ferment glucose. Can they ferment glucose and produce acids? They could be this organism. Or if they could produce acids and gas, no, they could ferment uh, glucose and produce acids and gas. If so, are they motil? Can they move? Okay. If yes, this could be the organism. If no, check if they're able to hydrolyze urea. If they could, it could be this organism. So check, could they utilize citrate? If so, this could be the organism. No? So this is what we use. This, we call this dichotomous key because reactions can go either way. No? So there are two ways by which a reaction can go. So uh, that would serve as a guide no, to us. So what are we going to do next? No, if you, if we come up with this particular result, okay, so we call that dichotomy, dichotomous key, and that can be found in the Burgess Manual of Classification. Okay, now moving on to part two of this discussion, we have the physical and nutritional growth requirements of bacteria. Shempre, because we work with them in the laboratory, it's important for us to know how to grow them, right? So, what are the nutrients that organisms would need in order for them to grow artificially in an artificial environment rather okay so the learning outcomes for this uh part of the topic would be you know, for you to be able to identify the growth requirements of bacteria and for you to be able to appreciate the importance of physiological and nutritional requirements for bacterial growth okay so like human beings microbes also need several elements for growth okay so they would need for major elements they need carbon of course oxygen or nitrogen okay so they need all these major elements in order for them to grow but they also need this trace elements no? so for trace elements they only need this for minimum uh at a minimum but they should be Present, of course, no. So these elements would act as cofactors for enzymatic reactions. Okay? Our bacterial organisms will not be able to perform okay, the needed metabolic functions if they do not have these major and trace elements available. Okay, so they only need a small amount. Okay, and it does not need to be added to the culture media because it's there now. It's included in the culture media. However, sometimes there are some elements that may not be found in the best culture media for a particular organism. So you get to add them. Okay? Or there are some organisms that would need more of a particular element. So we need to provide them in order to achieve you know, uh, the amount of growth that we want for the organisms that we have to grow in the laboratory. Okay, so based on their nutritional requirement or physiologic requirements, we can also classify organisms. Okay, so an organism is called a phototroph if they would get their energy from light. Okay, so some organisms need uh, light, not necessarily sunlight, no? artificial light inside the oven or the incubator would be. Uh, added or would be necessary in order for them to grow. Okay, Some organisms would need different types of chemicals in order for them to gather energy. And so we call them chemotrophs. Okay? So phototrophs are organisms that gather energy from light. Chemotrophs are organisms that gather energy from chemicals. Now, chemotrophs are further divided into the types of chemicals that they would need. Now, organisms that need inorganic chemical for energy are called chemolithotrophs. Those that would need organic chemical for energy source are called chemoorganotrophs. Okay? Now, organisms that would require carbon source 
okay, and use carbon dioxide as the source are called autotrophs, okay, or we call them also as capnophiles. Now, capnophiles are organisms that would need more carbon dioxide than normal, okay, so all organisms would need, uh, some organisms would need carbon dioxide, but those that would need a lot or uh, a lot an additional, rather, additional uh, percentage of carbon dioxide than normal are called capnophiles, okay? So again, you know, to avoid confusion, those that would need carbon dioxide are called autotrophs. And those that would, uh, those that would require a larger, a uh, amount of carbon dioxide are called capnophiles. Still, they're autotrophs, right? And those that would need organic compounds as their carbon source are called heterotrophs. So for growth factors, some organisms would require additional growth factors apart from those major and trace elements. Okay? So growth factors are essential substances that the organism is unable to synthesize, and so we add them. Okay? So they are required in small amounts also. Okay? So they could be purines or pyrimidines, no? so that uh, they could gather nucleic acids if needed. Okay? Uh, to to create rather nucleic acids, uh, some organisms would require amino acids, okay, so that they could synthesize their own proteins, and some would require a variety of vitamins, you no, know, like coenzymes and enzymes, you know, in order for them to perform metabolic processes. Okay, now the organisms that would require growth factors are technically called fastidious. Okay. In other words, ito sila yung mga arte. Okay? Yung mga arte-arte ng mga organisms. Kailangan pa ng dagdag na uh, growth factors and nutrients for uh, growth. Okay? So, a lot of our uh, disease-causing or pathogenic organisms are fastidious. Okay? Like Neisseria gonorrhea, for example, is considered a fastidious organism. Mycobacterium tuberculosis is also a fastidious organism. It would require a multitude of growth factors and other elements in order for them to grow luxuriantly in an artificial environment. Okay, so moving on, apart from the major and trace elements and additional growth factors, the usual requirement for growth are the following. So number one, we have oxygen. Of course, living organisms would require oxygen. However, uh, they have some of these microorganisms require uh, a lot. Some require only a small amount and some would not require it at all. Okay, so those that would really need oxygen for growth are called obligate aerobes. Ayan, no? So these tubes would show you their growth, okay? The small gray circles that you see inside those yellow uh, colored broths are actually colonies or bacterial growth. So if an organism is an obligate aerobe, meaning they really need oxygen for growth, they would be seen somewhere near the surface where oxygen is easily available. Okay. Then we have facultative anaerobes. Now, facultative anaerobes are technically aerobic organisms, but they could survive even in the presence of little or no oxygen. Okay, so you can see their growth, they're dispersed, right? Some are seen on the surface, some are seen uh, in the middle, and some at the bottom. Okay, so ito yung mga hindi maarte, okay lang, no? Kahit na konti lang yung oxygen, they could survive. And then we have here obligate anaerobes. These are the organisms that do not need oxygen for growth, otherwise they die okay, if there's oxygen present. Therefore, you can see them growing at the bottom of the tube, right down there. Okay, and then we have aerotolerant or uh, aerotolerant anaerobes. Okay, so these are anaerobes no, that can survive or tolerate a small amount of oxygen. So you can see them uh, similarly dispersed no, 
in the solution, but they grow best dun sa may bottom. Okay? Again, these are anaerobes talaga, but they could survive even in the presence of oxygen. Okay? This one, the facultative anaerobes, these are aerobic organisms, but they could uh, survive even in the presence of little oxygen. Okay? So facultative anaerobes are aerobic organisms. Aerotolerant anaerobes are anaerobic organisms. They are also known, by the way, no? aerotolerant anaerobes are also known as facultative aerobe. Okay? So uh, they are anaerobes that could survive in the presence of oxygen. Parang kabalik tara nitong facultative anaerobe. Now, microaerophiles are aerobic organisms, but they only need a very, very small amount of oxygen. And so they grow best at the middle where oxygen is at its thinnest, okay? So dito, microaerophiles. Konting oxygen lang, buhay na sila. Okay, so we can also uh, group organisms according to their ability to uh, produce no? uh, enzymes, okay? So our obligate aerobes, okay? And most of the facultative anaerobes are able to produce uh, superoxide, okay? superoxide dismutase and catalase, but they cannot produce peroxidase. Okay? Most aerotolerant anaerobes like streptococci can produce superoxide dismutase and peroxidase, but they cannot produce catalase. That's why they are negative for catalase test. Okay? So, see, si obligate anaerobes naman, okay? uh, they are unable to, no? they lack Superoxide, dismutase, catalase, and peroxidase. Okay? So they undergo lethal oxidation by various oxygen radicals when they're exposed to oxygen. Okay? So para silang nag-suicide pag merong oxygen. No, matay, mamatay atong mga uh, obligate anaerobes pag na-expose, even in little oxygen. So examples of obligate anaerobes are Clostridia and the Bacteroides group. Okay, now apart from oxygen, heat is also very important for survival. That's why we incubate them after introducing them onto gelatin media, right? So like humans, we need heat, okay? So thermal requirement is also an identifying factor. No? So those that are able to survive at... Uh, 20 to 40 degrees Celsius, no? So, optimum growth is at body temperature, okay? We call them mesophiles. So, most of the disease-causing organisms belong to this group, mesophiles, okay? Now, those that can survive in temperatures above 45 degrees Celsius are called thermophiles. And those that can survive beyond 45, uh, beyond... Uh, 80 degrees Celsius, pataas, no? Those that we can see in very, very hot surfaces are called hyperthermophiles, okay? Now, those that do not need heat, okay, there are some. We call them psychrophiles. They survive best in cold temperatures, no? So, we call them psychrotrophs or facultative psychrophiles. Those that can survive at zero, no, or... Uh, zero degrees are called psychrojuric. Yung mga nasa ref, nakakasurvive pa. So, tawag sa kanila, psychrojuric. They can endure. They can endure. Uh, they can endure cold temperature, freezer temperatures. Okay? So, again, note that those uh, organisms who are able to uh, produce infections or diseases are mostly mesophiles, no? those who can survive at 20 to 45 degrees Celsius and their optimum growth is usually between 
uh, 35 to 37 degrees Celsius. Okay. Mm -hmm. So thermophiles, again, uh, 45 degrees to 70 degrees. Uh, those that can survive higher than 70 degrees okay, are hyperthermophiles. Okay? So usually those are the archaeans, no? the old bacteria. And then, of course, water and salinity. The most indispensable requirement for growth is water. Okay, so living organisms would require water. Those that would need a lot of water or a lot of moisture in order for them to grow are called humidophiles. And those that live, no, those that can survive in dry environments like the desert are called serophiles, okay, serophiles, okay. So salt is a uh, very important uh, solute, no? of course, because it is uh, the solute present in most of the solutions inside the body. Okay? And then um, there are certain you know, differences as to the requirements of organisms when it comes to salt. Okay? Those that would require uh, an environment or a place to grow with a concentration of salt that's higher than normal are called halophiles. Okay? So salt is important. Everybody would need it because it's part of the solutions that we have. Okay? However, there are still some organisms that love to thrive in uh, environments with uh, a slightly higher okay, um, salt concentration. But still, they can survive even without a okay, sodium chloride. We call them halophiles. Okay? So mild halophiles can grow at environments uh, with 1 to 6% salt, moderate halophiles at 6 to 15% salt concentration, and uh, extreme halophiles at 15 to 30% salt concentration. Okay? Uh, those that can uh, tolerate okay, salt but grows best, no? At 0.9, kasi di ba, the normal concentration of body solution is at 0.85 or round it off, that's 1%. Okay? But there are those that grow best at that temperature, at that concentration, but can still survive even if slightly higher on concentration. We call them halo tolerant. Okay? Halo files, ganahan o parat parat. Okay? Halo tolerant, okay lang din kung medyo parat. Okay, kung medyo maalat, okay lang. Pero ang kanilang optimum environment would be yung konting-konti lang o yung normal lang, isotonic ang tawag. Okay? So, salt and water actually is, um, would change, you know, the concentration of salt and water would change because of uh, diffusion, no? processes that occur inside the body. Okay, so simple diffusion is the movement of a solute from higher concentration to a lesser concentration. Okay, so salt will diffuse, okay, or uh, yeah, so mag diffuse siya, papunta dun sa area na wala, no, yung solute. So kung saan yung hindi maalat, pupunta dun. Okay. So facil facilitated diffusion, on the other hand, would require uh, gates no, or channels. And this would need a, uh, energy or ATP. So this is what happens usually in our cell membrane. So gated. Okay? Kung water lang naman at mga small solute, okay, they would undergo simple diffusion. They would simply just pass through the channels in our uh, cell membrane. Okay? Hindi na kailangan ng energy para pumasok sila. Okay? However, some solute would require energy in order for them to enter into the membrane. And so they would require facilitated diffusion. Now, uh, water, uh, water moves across membranes in a process called osmosis. Okay? And syempre, 
the movement of water is similar to the movement of solute also. So water moves from an area of greater concentration to an area of lesser concentration. So kung saan ang kukulangin, doon pupunta yung tubig. So kung maalat sa labas, lalabas yung tubig sa loob. Kung maalat sa loob, papasok yung tubig galing sa labas. Okay? So, ganun ang ating mga processes, no? simple processes inside the body, osmosis and diffusion. So, osmotic pressure is the pressure required to stop water movement across the membrane. So, kung na-reach na yung equilibrium, pantay na o titigil na yung movement ng water natin. So, kailangan lang naman na ma-achieve yung equilibrium. So, the concentration of solute inside the cell and outside the cell should be balanced. Para normal ang growth and uh, processes na pagdadaanan ng ating organism. Okay? Or ng cell natin. Yan. So, note, no, when we talk about water and salt, so the, the types of solution would also come to mind. So we have isotonic solution, hypotonic solution, and hypertonic solution. So isotonic solution is uh, the type of solution that is present in the body under normal circumstances. Okay? So here... Okay, uh, the concentration inside and outside the cell is balanced in equilibrium. So those there is no net movement of water. If there's 0.9% of solute inside, that would mean there's also a concentration of about 0.9% outside. So that's isotonic solution. This is the best solution for bacterial growth. Okay. Now sometimes... Okay, the concentration is uh, the concentration of uh, solution is higher inside the cell no or higher yeah higher inside the cell okay? and then uh, compared to outside okay? so hypotonic means medyo lasaw yung nasa labas kulang ng solute okay tapos yung nasa loob medyo mas maraming solute so what happens is Water from outside would enter into the cell to balance no, the concentration. Okay? So again, maalat sa loob. No? Mataas yung concentration ng solution. Say nasa 0.3, uh, 3 rather, 3%. Mataas na yun. Kasi the normal solution would be at 0.9 or 1% the most. Okay? So if the concentration inside the cell is 3%, that's so high. So water from outside will enter into the cell. No? Water moves into the cell and it may cause the cell to burst. Okay? So if the cell wall is weak or damaged, it would undergo plasmoptysis. Okay? So it's a phenomenon undergone by bacterial cell where the cell swells and eventually it would burst. Okay, kasi uh, yung surface tension ng cell, no, naabot na. Okay, so puputok siya. Okay? Then we have here hypertonic ang solution. So what happens? Kabalik tala ng hypotonic. Okay? Kinulang yung sa loob. Mas maalat yung sa labas. So what would happen? Okay? As much as it can, no, the cell would try to balance the solution or the environment. So it would contribute its water content to the environment. No? Water would come out from the cell and would move into the envi environment in the hope that uh, equ equilibrium is achieved. Okay? However, kukunti lang naman yung concentration ng, ay yung water sa loob ng cell. Kasi ang liit, di ba? So what happens is that okay, in the process of contributing water, okay, madidehydrate yung ating cell. However, okay, Hin ma uh, the unusual thing is that the cytoplasmic membrane would shrink away from the cell wall. Okay? But the cell wall is uh, it's not flexible. Okay? It would not shrink. It can only swell, but it cannot shrink. 
And so, magsiseparate si cell membrane from the cell wall. Mag-shrink ang cell membrane. Okay? So, this is what we call plasmolysis. Okay? So, plasmoptysis is when water from outside enters inside the cell, causing the cell to swell and eventually burst. That's plasmoptysis. Yeah, we can see that if the environment is hypotonic. Okay? Now, in hypertonic naman, maalat sa labas compared sa loob ng cell. So what happens, the cell would try to uh, balance. Uh, it would flush out its water into the environment. So in the process, it would cause dehydration, causing the cell membrane to shrink away, separate and shrink away from the cell wall. Okay, so there would be no communication, there would be no growth kasi kailangan magkatabi si membrane and si cell wall. So kung malayo silang dalawa, there's no communication. So the cell is uh, neither growing nor undergoing processes. Okay? So this phenomenon is called plasmolysis and it's observed when the, solution, when the cell is in a hypertonic solution. Okay? Sana naintindihan natin yan. So, ang ating, the best uh, type of solution to grow our organisms in would be isotonic. Okay? So, ito yung mga kailangan nating bantayan. Okay? Dapat hindi masyado uh, kinulang sa solute or sumobra naman sa solute. Kasi that would kill the organism or it would cause the organism to be in a state of suspended animation. Okay, so anion, we have oxygen, light, carbon dioxide, okay, for energy, right? So energy, oxygen, um, trace and major elements, water and salt, and of course, the pH, okay? So we need to be able to provide the right pH in order for our organisms to grow in the laboratory, Okay? So when we say pH okay, or hydrogen ion concentration, okay, uh, we're talking about the acidity or the alkalinity of a solution in which we have placed our organisms. Now, most bacteria can survive at slightly acidic to neutral pH. No? So about 6.5 to 7.5. In some references, it's uh, more uh, alkaline, okay? 7.2 to 7.6. Okay. Um, either way, okay, take note of this ranges. Okay. So some organisms survive best at 6.5 okay, until 7.6. Okay. Molds and yeast prefer acidic environment. Okay. So 5, pH 5 to 6. Okay. So those that prefer the acid environment are called acidophils. Okay. And then those that would require uh, the neutral are called neutrophils. No? And then alkaliphiles naman para sa mga medyo mahilig sa alkaline environment. Okay? And on to our last part. For this topic, we have part three, bacterial growth. Okay? So the learning outcomes for this part would be for you to be able to describe the different phases of the bacterial growth curve and for you to be able to synthesize the importance of the processes involved in culturing bacteria. Okay, so uh, bacteria divides uh through binary fission. Okay, so mother cell divides into two daughter cell. So when we mean growth, there's an orderly increase in the quantity of the cell constituents, okay, causing to the cell to uh, divide into two uh, equal no, and similar cells. Okay, so binary fission simply occurs no, as the illustration shows. No, so first step. The cell would uh, elongate and the DNA is replicated, no? Na the double yung genetic material. Okay? And then it starts to uh, elongate. No? It would stretch out to accommodate the size of the genetic material that's being replicated. Okay? And then the start 
the, the cell wall and the plasma membrane would start to invaginate, no? nagkakaroon ng cleave. Okay? It would start to uh, show no? uh, the early beginnings of a division. And then eventually, cross walls will be formed no? and it would be uh, it would be able to divide okay, the cell completely into two daughter cells. Simple lang, di ba? Wala na yung telophase, metaphase, at kung ano-ano pang phases ng mitotic division ng human cell. So, napaka-simple. Kaya napaka-bilis nilang mag-multiply. Okay? So, DNA is replicated, cell elongates, uh, invagination shows, eventually, uh, a clear cross wall will be formed in between the two copies of the genetic material and two daughter cells will be formed. Now, this is the bacterial growth curve. It shows us the four phases of the bacterial growth. First, you know, we have the lag phase, LAG, followed by the log or the logarithmic phase or exponential or growth phase. Okay? And then we have the stationary phase and then the death or logarithmic phase. Okay. So the when the bacteria are grown in a closed system no, or in an environment that's artificial, like in the laboratory or like in a test tube, okay? So the population of cells almost always exhibits this growth dynamics. No? So cells initially adjust to the new medium. No? That's the lug phase. So there's still no growth. Okay? They do not yet divide no? as soon as they touch down on the gel okay? or in your body perhaps. Okay? So they are still adjusting. No, during the lag phase. Okay? And then when they are familiar with the environment and they have assessed no, the nutrients present, they can start dividing regularly by the process of binary fission. And so we have here the next phase, the logarithmic phase. No? So when they start dividing, you'll see here an increase no, in the number of uh, cells present in your culture media. Okay? Now, when their growth becomes limited, ibig sabihin nun, medyo malapit na nilang maubos ang nutrients present. Okay? The cells would stop dividing. And so they enter the stationary phase. Here, the number of organisms dividing is at a level no, or equivalent to the number of organisms dying. Kaya flat phase na yan or plateau ang phase natin. Okay? Eventually, they show loss of viability. No? Hinay-hinay na, mas marami na yung namamatay. Okay? On the gelatin media, we observe this as uh, flat or dry colonies already. Okay? O, alam natin, pag buhay pa, maumbok pa, convex pa yung mga colonies nila. No? May dome shape pa, tsaka glistening. When they appear dry and flat, uh, that usually indicates patay na yung ating mga kinukulture na organism. So they've entered their death or uh, logarithmic decline phase. Okay? So again, Lag phase, it's the stage where they're starting to get to know their environment. So they are they haven't started dividing yet. Eventually, when they are familiar with the area and have been acquainted with the nutrients present, they'd start to grow via uh, uh they start to multiply by, by via binary fission. And so they enter the logarithmic or exponential growth phase. No, kaya pa and then they'd reach a point where the nutrients is almost depleted. Waste materials are almost you know, uh, encroaching their growing space. Uh, here, we, they enter their stationary phase. You know? So the number of organisms dividing is already equivalent to the, norm, uh, the number of organisms dying. Eventually, they would use up their nutrients and start to die. 
Okay? And so they enter the death or decline phase at pababa naman yung growth curve natin. Okay? Now, uh, binary fission no? it occurs in a process called generation. Okay, so each generation iba iba for organisms. Okay, so generation time is a time taken for an organism to double its number or simply doubling time. Okay, so time required for a cell to divide. So yung isang uh, set ng binary fission no from uh, replication of the genetic material, elongation of cell, okay, and then invagination then cross wall formation and eventually uh division of into two daughter cell that's one generation time okay. so for example a single bacterium reproduces every 20 minutes so ilan na sila in an hour so we know that in an hour there would be 60 minutes so tatlong generation time right kaya Ang isang cell, no, nag-umpisa tayo ng isang cell, meron siyang tatlong generation time sa isang oras. Okay? So, after one hour or three generation times, yung isang organism ay magiging eight. Okay? So, first generation time, merong dalawa. Okay? And then the second generation time, yung dalawa will also divide, producing two, uh, producing four, right? Four bacteria, okay? At on the third generation time, yung four will be divided into eight microbes, no? So, ganun yung ating pag-compute na generation time. No? Pag-compute ng number of organisms depending on their generation time. Dali lang, di ba? Huwag niyo namang, okay, mag-alala. Okay, hindi tayo masyado mag-duel dyan. Hindi naman yun yung trabaho natin. Okay? So, ano lang to? Nice to know. Okay? Now, what causes exponential growth to stop? Why is there the death or decline phase. Okay? So there are actually four reasons. One is exhaustion of nutrients. Siyempre, okay? the nutrients are necessary for bacterial growth. E paano kung maubos na? Anong kakainin nila? Right? Second day, okay? of course, when they undergo metabolic processes and the use of nutrients, there would be waste production as well. And when waste accumulate within the environment where they are found, that would be toxic to the organisms as well. So it would contribute to the death of the organisms. Third, there would be toxin production. Okay? So toxin production may be due to an interaction of the chemicals you know, within the uh, environment. Okay? Or it could be produced by the organisms themselves. Or it could be because of the waste products present. Okay? And then all of this would lead to harmful change in pH. Okay? The presence of the waste materials as well as the toxins can cause changes in the pH, which would be harmful to the organism as well. Okay? So again, the reasons why there's a drop no, in the bacterial growth curve is because of exhaustion of the nutrients, waste product accumulation, toxin production, and a change of uh, the pH in the environment. Okay, That ends our discussion on bacterial growth and classification. You can use the following references to further your uh, understanding of this topic. Of course, again, you're free to use any other references that you have aside from Mahon and uh, Bailey and Scott's. Now you can use The Lost or Jowett's. Okay? and any other microbiology books available. Thank you for listening.